OK? Excellent. So hello, everyone. Are we having a good show so far? Who here has got to play with the 82-inch touchscreen? As lots of fun. I was uh, telling my kids about that last night. And they're quite jealous that I'm here and I got to play with it while they're back home. Um, so anyway, I'm Ben Armstrong, uh, work on the Hype V team. And uh, I'm actually really looking forward to doing this presentation. I was uh, chatting to Stu earlier today. And I was saying, I go around and I, I talk to at a lot of different events. And TechEd New Zealand and TechEd Australia are actually the only events that come to me and say, hey, Ben, can you come and do a level 400 session? You know, every other event that I do, if I propose a level 400 session, they're like, oh, I don't know. We'd prefer if you stuck at level 300. Uh, so I'm actually I'm really looking forward to uh, giving you some deep insight into what actually happens under the covers and giving you a better understanding of Hyper-V today. Um, it is my goal that I will overwhelm you with information in the next hour. So we'll see how we go with that. Uh, before I get going, though, I do want to uh, make one small apology. Uh, I am going to be using videos for my demos today. Uh, I had hoped to use uh, VPN and connect to my lab uh, back in the States. Unfortunately, when I tried that, uh, it was more like a slideshow uh, than a demo. And as you're going to see uh, in the videos, some of the hardware that we have in our labs is incredibly expensive, and they don't let me ship it overseas. Uh, so my apologies, we are going to have some videos today. But uh, hopefully, we'll still have lots of fun. So one of the things I want to kind of dive into today and focus on is the scale of Hyper-V in Server 2012. Now, hopefully, none of this is new to you. Hopefully, uh, you know, you've seen the release information. And you've seen that with Server 2012, we have not just improved our scale numbers. We have done drastic you know, improvements. You know, in most of these places, we're talking 4, 5, 10x improvements. And I'll tell you, from the guys who worked on this, we had two teams inside Hyper-V who were dedicated on this. We had a, a scale team, and we had a high-performance virtual machine team. Their motto for this release, the thing that they really focused on, was we never want to hear about a workload that can't be virtualized. You know, and some people have actually come to me and said, like, hey, these numbers are kind of crazy and out there. Um, but when we were with Server 2008 R2, when we were talking to people, even when we were talking to people who were doing lots of virtualization, we'd say, have you virtualized everything? And they'd say, well, we've virtualized everything except that SQL cluster, except our SAP system. And there was always this except. And we really wanted uh, to take that away. The other thing that I want to highlight with these numbers, though, and I realized I needed to update this because we announced we're doing 8,000 VMs in a cluster. And I haven't updated that. Um, these aren't fictitious numbers. These aren't you know, back of the napkin, we did the numbers. All of these numbers are tested. And we're adamant that we don't sign off on numbers until not only are they tested, but they're tested at scale. So we, like, when we say you know, uh, 8,000 virtual machines in a cluster, we're not talking you know, blank virtual machines with 32 meg of RAM. No, we ran real workload. We ran it at the scale. And we confirmed that it worked to a reasonable expectation of performance. Um, so you know, these aren't fictitious numbers. And we're very proud of that. So now I want to talk about what we had to do to the architecture of Hyper-V to pull off some of these numbers. So first thing, supporting physical computers with 320 physical processors. Uh, this one's actually a really fun one for us. And one of the reasons why it's really fun is there's this bit of game of cat and mouse that goes on between us and the various OEMs. Because the OEMs love to be able to, to sell this huge hardware. 
Uh, but they can't sell the hardware without the software, but we can't build the software without the hardware. Uh, so we have this game of cat and mouse because we'll have OEMs come to us and say, hey, can you guys support this number? And we'll say, you give us the box and we'll build the software. And they'll say, well, we, we want you to build the software and guarantee that you're going to build the software before we invest in the hardware. Uh, so there's a, a bit of back and forth that goes on. But this is a very big number uh, for us. For people who are familiar with the Windows architecture in general, you'll know that up until recently, just plain Windows Server couldn't go up to 320 logical processors. So what have we done to enable this? Well, the first thing we've done is something that we call hypervisor early launch. This is a big architectural change for us. And it's, you know, as is often the way, it's a big architectural change that's not at all obvious when you're using the platform. Uh, in Windows Server 2008 R2, you would install Windows Server on the box, you would enable Hyper-V, you would reboot, Windows would still boot, and one of the first things Windows would do is it would actually load the hypervisor underneath itself. With Windows Server 2012 and Windows 8, we've changed that. You enable Hyper-V, you reboot, it's actually Hyper-V that now does the initial boot process. It's actually the first thing that loads before the kernel, before any other code, the first thing that loads is the hypervisor. And it comes up and it starts running. Now, why did we do this? Why did we make this change and why did we make it now? Well, there are a number of things that we can do if the hypervisor loads first. And we have this interesting challenge uh, around the parent partition. Because if you're familiar with Hyper-V architecture, you know we have a parent partition, we have child partitions. And the operating system that you think is running on the box with a Hyper-V installation is actually just the, virtual uh, just the first virtual machine on the system. That's the way the, the architecture is built. Well, with Windows coming up and loading the hypervisor very early on, we had this problem. Uh, one of the, the senior architects on the Windows kernel team once stated that the, the job of the Hyper-V team was to lie to the operating system and that we did a very good job at it. You know, we let the operating system run on top of us and we told it all interesting stories about what was happening and it believed us. Well, with Windows coming up first and loading the hypervisor, there was actually a brief moment of time where Windows, the parent partition, would actually see the truth about the hardware that it was running on. And in that time, there was a bunch of code that would start making assumptions about like, oh, I've got these sort of resources, I've got that. And that actually became a problem for us. And so we changed this around so that the hypervisor has complete control over what the parent partition thinks it has available to it. And the reason we did this in server 2012 is to enable a feature that we call the minimal parent hypervisor. And what happens here is if you're on one of these boxes with you know, 80 cores, 120 cores, et cetera, when you load Hyper-V uh, and you reboot, the hypervisor comes up, it goes, great, I've got 128 cores. It then boots up the parent partition, but only tells it it has 64. So you have 64 cores. The rest are for us. And we did that for a couple of reasons. The first reason is once we get to these sorts of really large scales, we don't need the parent partition to have access to all that resource. You know, we can get better efficiency by cordoning off some of those processors and saying, you know what, these are just used for virtual machines now. The parent partition is never going to run on these. The second reason uh, is that it makes it convenient for us because uh, we only support virtual machines up to 64 virtual processors, and it made the coding for us easier if we just said, yep, it's another virtual machine, the limit is 64 virtual processors. So by default, we have this limit, and I had to smile. I actually had uh, an account manager 
in Microsoft Australia email me two days ago and say, hey, my customer just enabled Hyper-V on Windows Server 2012 on a box with 80 cores, and he's only seeing 64 cores in the parent partition. What's going on? You know, and my response was, is he coming to TechEd next week? <laughs> um, so we actually do have, uh, we do expose this information about what's happening into the UI in the parent partition. We also have some BCD edit flags where you can go in and play around with this yourself. So I have some screenshots here, and what we've actually done is this is just on a box which has eight cores, and we've gone in and we've used BCD edit to say, hey, only let the par parent partition see two cores. So what you can see here is if we look at Task Manager, let me see, yeah, laser pointer, um, it tells us I've got eight logical processors in the box, but the host only has two logical processors. And that's what the, the parent partition sees. And we have similar information is being exposed in Performance Monitor, and we also have extra information being exposed uh, through the various other interfaces in Windows, where you now have, and basically what's happening is all of the APIs that you would traditionally use to find out how many, how many cores do I have, they're going to return the minimized set now. And we've added new APIs where you can go and say, no, really, like how much is in the physical box? So that's what we did for supporting a large number of processors on the, on the physical computer. But what about in the virtual machine? Uh, this is actually, uh, uh, this is a conversation I've been wanting to have for a while now. Uh, there's a lot of confusion out there because our main competitor, VMware, has talked a lot about what they do, and we've never actually talked about what we do. So first I want to kind of set the background and explain the challenge that exists around supporting virtual machines with really large number of processors. So hopefully, being in a level 400 session, this is going to be familiar with you, but we, we all understand that on a computer, standard multitasking thing, not everything actually runs at the same time. You know, we make it look like things are running at the same time by time slicing and moving things back and forth. And we do the same with a hypervisor. As soon as you start running more virtual processors than we have physical processors, then we you know, don't run all at the same time and we schedule them when, when they need to be run. Now this is very simple if you have uh, uniprocessor virtual machines. I've actually done just a little diagram to say, you know, imaginary system with a workload. We have a bunch of virtual processors, we have four cores, and as the system runs, we start getting workload on specific virtual processes. So we schedule them, we get that workload run, and while that's happening, new workload comes in. And we have this old workload that's now higher priority. And so we deschedule and we schedule that. So this is really simple if you're only scheduling, scheduling one virtual processor at a time. Where things become really hard is when you start looking at operating system design, operating systems have made this crazy assumption, okay, it's completely reasonable if you're on physical hardware. They made an assumption that, hey, all my processors will actually be running at the same time. And so it's entirely reasonable for a piece of code running on one processor to take a dependency on code on another processor performing an operation. This becomes a big problem for virtualization and for scheduling virtual machines with large numbers of processors. So now I'm going to show you. I actually had a lot of fun doing this. This was just kind of an idea that I put together. What I've done here is with the little flow that we had just before, I've got exactly the same number of virtual processors now. And I'm actually going to have the same workload come in. Only this time I've gone, we have one four virtual processor virtual machine and we have two two virtual processor virtual machines. And those things now have to be scheduled together. So 
you can get the deck afterwards, or you can see the exactly the same virtual processes come hot at the same time. Uh, but you can see here, now we have a problem. We've got five virtual processors that have come hot, and it's actually the best we can do here is service two of them. So we choose these two, we service those. Now those ones that we didn't service have gone hot, we've had new workload come in, we're going to deschedule, we'll schedule the two red ones, new workload comes in, and things are getting bad. You know, as you can see, this doesn't work. Um, so the diagram that I've just shown you is what's referred to in the industry as gang scheduling. The idea that you would take these threads of execution, these virtual processes, and you would group them together. And gang scheduling is what VMware does today. And you can actually see very simply from that diagram that this approach has led VMware to provide guidance where they say, hey, least number of virtual processes possible, please. You know, go in, figure out your workload, and hey, if you can run it on UniProcessor, please run it on UniProcessor. But please be really careful about the sizing. That is not what we have done. Uh, we took a completely different approach. We said, hey, we're Microsoft. Let's go fix the operating system. And this is actually, this is one of the first things that uh, the Hyper-V team did when we started working on Hyper-V. We went, we sat down uh, with, the, with the Windows kernel team, and we kind of, we talked them through this whole problem space, and said, so this is, this is bad. Um, the Windows kernel team came back to us and said, like, okay, we understand why this is a problem. However, uh, we don't want to go in and change our behavior on all hardware platforms. So we actually came up uh, with uh, an API uh, that we have documented, we've had documented uh, since the first release of Hyper-V, where the hypervisor is actually able to let Windows know, hey, you're running on a hypervisor, I provide no guarantee that all your virtual processors are going to be running at the same time. And then the Windows kernel is able to adjust, and it's able to understand that, and it's able to accept that in its tolerances. So this logic has been in since Windows Server 2008 and later. So this means a couple of things. The first thing is I, I do occasionally get people come to me and say, hey, Ben, like you say you're supporting 64 virtual processors. Uh, what about Windows Server 2003? The most we're ever going to support on Windows Server 2003 is two virtual processors. That's our maximum support limit there. And the reason for that is we haven't gone in and made the changes to the kernel in order to make the scalability story work there. Um, the second thing, though, is people do often come to me and say, uh, basically, they've come from a VMware background. They're used to being very careful about sizing the virtual processors for their virtual machines. And they asked me about sizing virtual processors for Hyper-V virtual machines. And I say, it doesn't matter, because it, it just doesn't. You know, oh, one of the, the conversations I've had recently, um, we don't support hot out of processor, something I'd love to do, but we don't do it. Um, and I'd had someone say to me, hey, I have a workload that's normally idle, and it's a, we get like seasonal bursts. How do we handle that? I'm like, well, just give it eight VPs. You know, if you think it's going to burst up to needing eight VPs, set it up that way. You know, it's like, and, and their response was, well, you know, isn't that going to cause problems for the system while uh, the workload's idle? Nope, not with Hyper-V. You know, it is perfectly fine to, you know, over, you know, allocate uh, CPUs because we have a very, very low cost for idle virtual processors. In fact, personally, like I, on all my systems, I don't run uniprocessor virtual machines. I'm sorry. I wouldn't do that on physical hardware. Um, I don't use it with virtual machines. My smallest virtual machine is always uh, two virtual processor. That way I have the, the protection if something goes wrong, and the, the, there's no performance impact to doing that. So for us, supporting 64 virtual processors was actually more of a testing burden than a development burden. 
Um, there were a couple of small bugs here and there that we had to go through and fix. Uh, but there were no big architectural changes moving from 2008 R2 to 2012 in supporting these really large scales of virtual processors. So, next up, one terabyte of memory in a virtual machine. Now, this did require a lot of work, unlike virtual processors. Um, and where the, the, there were two areas where the work came in uh, for supporting one terabyte uh, of memory in a virtual machine. The first one was there were a lot of errors in Hyper-V where we had to go back and performance tune. Uh, because, you know, for instance, no one ever complained to us about how long it took to save state a virtual machine. No one has. Like, it's always like, I've never had someone come to me and say, it takes too long. One terabyte virtual machine, when we first enabled that on server 2012, it took two and a half hours to save state a one terabyte virtual machine. And we guessed that that might be a problem. Um, so we had to go through and do a lot of work. And there are a lot of different things, you know, just turning on the virtual machine, doing the initial memory allocation. We did a lot of tuning where in the past, you know, oh, okay, it took a minute. Whereas now it's like, wait, that's taking half an hour? Okay, let's go back, let's you know, do optimization. And most of that was just you know, straightforward optimization, you know, good coding. The next big challenge we had uh, was to do with our old friend and enemy, Numa. Uh, so hopefully most people here are familiar with Numa. I'm not going to talk about everything on this slide. But the, the simple version is, these days, you have a physical machine that has large amounts of memory. Then that memory is actually separated into nodes that are accessible by different groups of processors. Now, ideally, at the physical layer, you want to have your processing load talking to the memory that's in the same node. That gives you your best performance. What you don't want is people talking all over the place. You know, what happens here, and unfortunately this varies from system to system, but basically the, your memory speed can get severely degraded. Now depending on the system that you're on, talking to memory on a remote node can cause anywhere from you know, a 20% degradation to a 500% degradation. We've seen systems where you had the 500% degradation. Now, we've dealt with this in the past through, we provided, we've always aimed, okay, let's try and keep a virtual machine and its memory in the same NUMA node. Makes sense. And we've provided a basic control where you as the user could tell Hyper-V whether that should be best effort or absolute. No, we, base, we had a setting where you can say, hey, if you can't fit it in a NUMA node, that's okay, let it go. Or you could say, hey, if you can't fit it in a NUMA node, just don't run it, please. Now, when we start talking about 64 virtual processor virtual machines, one terabyte of memory, trust me, I know this, there is not a system in the world where you can fit that in a single NUMA node. Now, once you start getting at these high levels of scale, you're always going to be running in multiple NUMA nodes. So how do we handle this? What we ended up doing, uh, with lots of debate involved, is we now expose a virtual NUMA topology into a virtual machine. So we make the virtual machine itself look like it has multiple NUMA nodes. This way, we are able to run parts of the virtual machine on different physical NUMA nodes, and the software running inside the virtual machine is able to be aware that, that, that there are separate NUMA nodes, and it's able to make sure it gets the best performance uh, out of that system. So a couple of things to know about this. The first one is, uh, by default, we only turn on uh, virtual NUMA if you have over eight virtual processors assigned to a virtual machine. Um, if you have less than eight virtual processors, we won't turn it on by default. 
Um, the second thing is today, and this bums me out, but it is where we're at. Today, if you have uh, multiple virtual NUMA nodes in a system, uh, we don't support the use of dynamic memory uh, on that virtual machine. As I said, that bums me out. I have a personal goal that I like to see all our features working at all times. Um, and that's one case that we have today where it's not correct. Now, by default, when you create a virtual machine, we will go through, we will look at the physical hardware that you're on, and we try to create the best virtual NUMA topology for that physical hardware. However, something that uh, you should be considering if you're having a lot of large-scale hardware in your environment is the best NUMA topology is not the same for every single physical box. So if you're going to be live migrating a virtual machine around between boxes, you may need to go in and figure out what the best NUMA topology is for your environment. Now, the simple thing to do here is, is basically go, the calculation is basically a lowest common denominator. You need to look at your environment and go, OK, I've got the following hardware. Uh, what's the smallest NUMA node that exists? You know, if you have a box which has four cores per NUMA node and 16 gig of memory per NUMA node, and that's the smallest NUMA node that exists in your environment, then that's what you're going to want to set as the NUMA topology for your virtual machine. Um, so we actually have a UI. I've got a screenshot of it here. Uh, this was just grabbed from my system where it's put in the default values that it's calculated. Now, the one thing that I will point out is if you put the wrong numbers in here, you will really hurt performance. Um, and this is actually, I, I did some training with our support engineers uh, earlier on this year. Uh, and one of the things that I told them is like, look, if you're talking to someone and they're seeing some screwy performance, one of the first things I want you to do is come in and get them to hit this button. Because that button, the Use Hardware Topology button, tells Hyper-V, hey, go do your calculations to figure out what the best settings are for this physical box. Um, so this is something to be aware of, though, especially if you're going to be doing live migration among boxes which you know have significantly different hardware configurations with large amounts of memory involved. So final thing I want to say on large memory, and I'm going to actually, I'll flip over to the demo. And as I said, I apologize, this is a recorded demo. Um, so this is a recording of us doing a live migration of a virtual machine that has 64 virtual processors, one terabyte of memory. It's running uh, active SQL workload. As you can see, memory utilization and CPU utilization are both very high. Now, I use time lapse in this video because we have a dual 10 gigabit link between the two boxes. And even then, it takes about 40 minutes to do the live migration. Uh, but the key thing is, it works. We live migrate the virtual machine. We don't drop the SQL connections. Um, and this is actually, this was one of our big kind of goals that we set for ourselves when we were working on scale, was we said, we're not going to sign off on these scale numbers until we know that we can reliably, repeatedly live migrate at the scale number under workload. Now, I will highlight, I've had to do some editing on this video, and it's a bit of a strange video, because I have some challenges. First challenge, we're running on hardware that hasn't been released yet, and I'm not allowed to tell you what it is. And of course, being good IT guys, when my test team put the system together, they named the OS name after the hardware it was running after. So you can see that I've put little red squiggle, scribbles over the host names. Uh, I was actually hopeful. I, 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 I'm terrible at keeping track of release cycles. So I was, at the beginning of this week, I was logging into the different OEM sites and being like, have they released it yet? No, they haven't. OK, let's go and scribble that out. The other thing is I'm not actually legally allowed to tell you the workload that's running in the virtual machine. 
which is why I'm using remote desktop instead of VM connect to connect to the virtual machine, because once again, yeah, my test team had named the, the virtual machine after the workload that was running in it. Uh, so we had some, a lot of stuff there. But as you can see, live migration went across, the connection wasn't dropped. Um, and this is something, like, I can tell you personally, trying to capture this video, I think I did, the, did this migration about half a dozen times. Uh, simply because every time we'd do it and we'd look at the video and I'd see one more thing where I'm like, ooh, I'm not allowed to show that on stage. Um, but I will say, and this is uh, one of the things I couldn't ship out here. In our test lab, uh, we actually now have one machine with four terabyte of memory and two machines with two terabyte each. Um, with the four terabyte memory machine, uh, I actually went down to the lab when it arrived and I was there when one of our test leads held up. He had a single uh, 512 gig DIMM. And he held it and he looked at me and he said, this is worth more than my house. <laughs> and I said, don't drop it. So, we've been talking about processor memory scale. That's just part of the picture. The next thing that we've been working on is faster I.O. You know, we need to be able to build systems that can actually you know, push a one terabyte memory, 64 VP. And that's where I.O. comes in. And there's been a couple of key investments that we've made here. So the first one is the SRIOV technology for networking. And the way this works is this is a new hardware standard that's coming out. And a very simple way to think about this is if you can remember, you know, way back when, you know, when we were first getting into virtualization on x86, the processors didn't support virtualization. And we had to do a lot of gunk in software to just make virtual machines work at all. Uh, and then Intel, AMD came along, put hardware virtualization support into the processors so that we were able to get hardware performance out of them. In a lot of ways, SRIOV is like that for networking. We're now putting understanding of virtualization into networking. So when you get an SRIOV-enabled network adapter, you have hardware where the software is able to call down and say, hey, give me a new virtual NIC, please. And the hardware is able to create virtual NICs. It's able to do routing and switching. And it's able to do all that managing itself. So what actually happens here, I've got a little diagram. This is the traditional model that we have uh, network without SRIOV. You know, traditionally, We'd have our virtual network adapter in the virtual machine. It would go into the parent partition. We'd have our virtual switch, and that goes out to the physical NIC. With SROV, the physical NIC actually exposes a new, what's called by the spec, a virtual function, which is basically a new instance of itself. And the virtual machine is actually able to directly access through DMA that network adapter. So a couple of key things uh, to point out here. In our testing, now we've obviously done a lot of uh, performance tuning for our existing software path. We're very proud of it. We get you know, great throughput out of it. So in our testing, uh, testing with uh, a 10 gigabit interface, moving between software and SROV, we actually didn't see much of a change in throughput because we're able to saturate a 10 gigabit link today uh, just using our software mode. Where we saw big changes, though, first, CPU usage. So in order for us to do a 10 gigabit saturation on the software path, we were pretty much using an entire core. You know, you could go in and look at the stats, and we were pretty much burning an entire CPU on the box to pull that off. You enable SROV, the CPU utilization, zero. Just going away. 
Uh, the second thing that we saw as a big benefit here uh, was latency. Uh, we saw much, much lower latency uh, when using SROV. There are, uh, well, there's really one, uh, not one, two. There are two caveats to keep in mind, though, when looking at SROV. The first one is, unfortunately today, it is a bit of a pain to manage. And the reason for that is every SROV device on the market today has a finite number of virtual functions that it can support. And we've seen different from different devices, uh, different devices and different vendors. We've seen some devices where they only support four virtual functions. We've seen devices that support, I believe the most we've seen is 64. Um, however, and we are working with the committee on this to get this changed, there are two key things missing from the SROV spec for us. First, there's no way for the hardware to tell us how many virtual functions it supports. And second, there's no way for it to tell us how many it has left. Um, so, this is a bit of a problem. And what happens in Hyper-V today, and this is the unfortunate uh, compromise that we ended up with, is you can go into a virtual machine and you can say, I would like this virtual network adapter on this virtual machine to get SROV if it's available. But we can't guarantee that that virtual machine will always get SROV. So unfortunately today, that's something, as I said, it's a managerial overhead that you're going, if you're going down this path, you have to keep in mind, hey, how many virtual functions do I have? How many virtual machines have I turned this on? Uh, we do let you know whether you have SROV or not when the virtual machine's running. Uh, but if the virtual machine's off, there's no way for us to tell you, hey, if you turn that on, are you actually going to get SROV? We don't know, unfortunately. Um, the second thing to be aware of, and this catches a couple of people by surprise, um, SROV, virtual machine, DMA directly to the physical hardware. So if you've heard anything about all the cool uh, extensible virtual switch stuff we've been doing, doesn't work here because that's all in the parent partition. And SROV bypasses the parent partition. Another example, and this is this has been, come as a big surprise for a number of people, is hey, Windows Server 2012, we finally support uh, network teaming. If you do network teaming in the parent partition, doesn't help here because we're bypassing the parent partition. And so one of the things that we have actually documented, tested, uh, we're recommending to people is hey, if you care about performance and availability, then what you really need to do is put two SROV NICs in your physical box, expose two virtual NICs into the virtual machine using SROV on the different physical interfaces, and then configure teaming inside of the virtual machine. That is the only way to get the combination of link redundancy and direct hardware performance uh, inside of a virtual machine. Now, one really cool thing about SROV, and as I said earlier, like, we try really hard to make sure all our features work together, is we actually got this to work with live migration, which you may be wondering, how on earth do you do that? You know, you're talking about directly uh, talking to the hardware. Uh, this was actually something that we spent a lot of time working on. We were strongly of the belief that if we can't make it work with live migration, there's no point doing it. Because we genuinely believe that if we'd come out with a solution where we're like, hey, we can make your networking really fast if you give up live migration, that most people would just go, ha, ah, yeah, nice. <laughs> so we did a lot of work. So let me show you what this works like. So the first thing to understand is we actually allow you to enable and disable support for SROV at any stage, while a virtual machine is running, while a virtual machine is off. And the way we do this is 
when you have a virtual machine and you've gone into the virtual network adapter enabled IOV, we actually expose two interfaces into the virtual machine. There's only one place in the operating system that you can see this, and I'll show you that in, in a video in a moment. But we expose two interfaces. We expose our traditional software virtual network adapter, but we also expose the SROV network adapter. And what we do is, and unfortunately, this is a confusing word to use here. I'll explain. There's no better word to use, so I just have to use it and explain it. We create a team. Now, this isn't using the Windows Server 2012 uh, network teaming. This is actually a very lightweight team uh, that we designed solely for this purpose. Because the only thing that this team does is it's basically an A or B switch. If SRIOV is there and we have a hardware path, boom, everything goes down the hardware path and the software path is unused. But if SRIOV is not there, we switch back and we go down the software path. Um, so if you enable SRIOV, you actually don't see much different inside the virtual machine except for the performance. So with this infrastructure, what we're able to do is while the virtual machine's running, if you choose to live migrate it, we go in, we break the team, remove the virtual function. Network packets continue to flow. This is all done live without any drop. We just transition down the software path. Once we're on the software path, then we can migrate as normal. We do a standard live migration. We come up on the other side. We reestablish the software path. And then we'll reassign a virtual function. But some key things to note here. One, this actually lets you do live migration between a box which has SRIV and one that doesn't. Because if the destination doesn't, then OK, we're just in software mode. It also lets you live migrate between different vendors. And that's actually, actually, I'll just handy link, get this deck afterwards. If you haven't read John Howard's blog on this, he has a long series, Everything You Need to Know about SROV. But I'm going to show you a video now where we do just that. We do a, a live migration of a virtual machine between two boxes with different physical network adapters, if I remember which computer to use. So here we have a virtual machine that currently doesn't have SRIOV enabled. It's just using the software mode. And I'll highlight, we have three things open in the virtual machine. The first one is the device manager, because the device manager is actually the only place in Windows where you can see SROV in action. Everywhere else it's hidden. We have the network connections up, and that's just there to show you it's not going to change. Throughout this whole demo, it's not going to change. And we have the ping going so that you can see that, hey, network connectivity is enabled the whole time. So we're using PowerShell here. And this is the, the PowerShell command to enable IOV uh, for this network adapter. So what you'll see is, as it runs, second later, OK, we have an Intel virtual function exposed into that virtual machine. Now, nothing else has changed to the appearance of the software. You know, as you can see, the network adapter and network connections didn't change. The ping's still going. But traffic is now going through that network, directly through the hardware, and not through the software side. This is actually a video from John Howard, and for some reason, he thinks it's incredibly exciting that the device vendor ID is the Intel one. <laughs> I work with what I get given, unfortunately. So that was just him showing, hey, look, it, it actually is the, the vendor ID. So in a moment, what we're going to do is we're going to live migrate this virtual machine to a box that's not using Intel, but is actually using a Broadcom network adapter. So that's my little indicator. So we'll do the live migration command. This is why I hate using videos. You can't speed them up. 
So the key thing that you're going to see is when the migration starts, the Intel virtual function will be removed, and we're going to go back to the software-only path. That will be used for the length of the migration. Once the migration is complete, we're going to have a Broadcom adapter appear. Now, the interesting thing is, if you have a look at the latency of the ping there, we got a little latency blip for the actual live migration, but there's no latency hit for the removal or addition of the device. So here we are. We've live migrated across. We're now in a system with a completely different network adapter. Traffic's flowing through it, and there's been no disconnection at any point in time. So I think that's pretty cool. So the next thing I want to talk about for I.O. is storage. And there are a number of things that we've done for storage performance. But the first thing that I really, I have to address this, because this gets me angry every time. I'm sorry. When you're talking to the Hyper-V team, what's the best storage, uh, what's the best storage for performance? It's a VHD. Seriously. It's not a pass-through device. And this surprises people. It's not a fiber channel device. Our best performance option is and always has been a fixed size VHD. Um, that's the path that we spend a lot of time optimizing. We've done virtual fiber channel in this release. I'm not going to talk about it in the session because it actually doesn't perform better than VHD. It performs about the same as VHD. I have a storage session this afternoon, and I'll talk about the reasons why you would want to use virtual fiber channel there. Um, but, and this gets me, because I know, I know, I know there are going to be people who are like, yeah, I've got virtual fiber channel, I'll use it, because this is a high performance workload. No, don't. If you have other reasons for using virtual fiber channel, fine. But if your goal is, I want the best performance possible, then use a fixed size VHD. It really is the best option out there. So one of the, there are a number of investments that we've made in this release to further increase VHD performance. Um, the first one is the new VHD format, VHDX. Um, now, no one likes it when software people bring out new formats. It causes lots of pain and suffering and gnashing of teeth and wailing and so on. Um, and we understand that. But there are a couple of things I will highlight. The first one is our current format, the VHD format, was designed in 1995 to allow you to run Windows 3.1 on a Mac. It was not designed for modern service. It's done incredibly well, but it's got as far as it has. But it was not designed for the world that we live in today. The second thing that I'll point out, and this actually surprises everyone, is in Windows Server 2012, we actually provide the tools that not only allow you to convert VHDs to VHDXs, but we allow you to convert back uh, as long as you know, you're not too, uh, it's not over the size limit for VHD or so on. Um, so we're, we understand that not everyone's going to move to VHDX overnight, uh, but if you can, you should be moving to it now. There are a number of reasons for it. In this session, I'm just going to focus on some of the performance uh, reasons. As I said, I have a storage session this, uh, later this afternoon where I'll be talking about some of the other reasons. Um, so some of the key uh, performance issues. The first one, and this is a, a format change in general, is we have increased the block size and the block cache for a VHDX. Now, the impact of this is that it does use a little bit more space if you're using a dynamic VHD. Um, in our tests, on average under load, we saw a dynamic v VHDX using about half a gig more than its VHD counterpart. However, on the flip side, what did it do for performance? It did this. We thought that was kind of a good trade-off to make. So VHDXs will be a little bit larger uh, than VHDs. But, and let me just highlight, because sorry, this is my, my irate moment. Let me just highlight, 
Fixed performance on VHD, better than pastor. Fixed performance on VHD, uh, VHDX, better than VHD. Please don't use pastor. Don't, just don't. Don't. Um, this is, we actually, we have, I, I love this guy. We have a, a tester called Liang, and he has his own uh, test bed. Uh, it's actually the test bed that we used uh, for uh, the TechEd US keynote to hit a million IOPS in a single virtual machine. But the, the physical hardware that's used for this is 64 off-the-shelf SSDs. Uh, it's 64 off-the-shelf SSDs uh, with eight HBAs, eight SSDs on each HBA. Um, so it's actually, it's impressive because it's just, honestly, it's all built with commodity stuff. There's no uh, specialized top secret stuff here. Um, and here's the, the sequential uh, performance difference. So VHDX does provide significant improvements over VHD. Um, once again, don't use pasta. Um, so the next thing I'd like to talk about is I.O. scaling. And this is the story of what we had to do uh, to be able to do a million IOPS from a single virtual machine. So can I just have a show of hands? Who here saw the, the keynotes where we demoed the, the million IOPS from a single virtual machine? Got a couple of hands here. So this is actually, let me explain uh, some of the story here. This has been uh, long term. Am I being recorded? I'm still going to say it anyway. Okay. It's been a long term pissing match between us and VMware. Um, it, it has. It, it, it has. You know, uh, this started with, uh, this was a couple of years ago now. Uh, VMware came out and made a big uh, release going like, hey, we can drive a million IOPS from a VMware server. And what they were doing was they had 10 virtual machines, each of which were driving 100,000 IOPS. And they were able to get a million. But the reality was they couldn't push much more than 100,000 IOPS uh, per virtual machine. So of course, we came out a couple of months later and like, hey, we can do that too. And then a year or two later, like, hey, we can do a million IOPS from three virtual machines. So now we've got to the stage where we can do a million IOPS from one virtual machine. So I don't know where we go next. Um, in our lab, we've actually been able to get about 1.3 million IOPS from a single virtual machine. And that was actually uh, using the, the same rig, 64 SSDs uh, on eight controllers. Now, we had to make a couple of key changes in order to hit that number. So in SIR 2008 R2, we had a virtual machine. Uh, we created a VM bus channel uh, for storage communication. And what we created was we created one channel per VM, and it was handled by one VP in the virtual machine. Um, and we had one queue for an entire SCSI card. Now, the reality was that for 2008 R2, that kind of worked. However, for 2008 R2, we only supported virtual machines with up to four virtual processors. Once you start talking about virtual machines with up to 64 virtual processors, the idea of, for instance, having a single VP handle the I.O. just doesn't work. So the changes we made. First, we now do one channel per 16 virtual processes per SCSI device. So once you start getting to these 32, 64 virtual processor virtual machines, you're getting a lot more channels for communication. We changed our queue to being per SCSI adapter to being per device. And finally, we changed our I.O. handler so that instead of being scheduled and assigned to a single virtual processor, it could be scheduled across multiple virtual processors. Um, all these changes combined are what allowed us to go 
as high as 1.3 million uh, IOPS from a single virtual machine. The so next storage change I want to talk about is ODX. How many people here have heard about ODX? Okay, we've got a couple of hands. So I'll go through the summary very quickly. The ODX is Windows Server exposing new capabilities from the SAN. And the summary is that in the past, if you needed to copy data from one location to another on a SAN, Windows would pull that data off the SAN, store it in memory, and write it back to the SAN. And it would do that in chunks over and over again. And frankly, this is crazy. You know, the, we're generating a lot of traffic, and these days, SANs are very intelligent. Now, if you think about it, if you have a SAN that has, let's say, built-in deduplication support, if you tell it natively to copy a file, all it's going to do is it's going to create a new pointer to that file. You go, great, because it's instantly deduplicated. Um, so ODX is basically a system where we do just that. Rather than moving the data around ourselves, we get tokens from the SAN that represent the data, and we then tell the SAN, okay, here's what we want you to do with it. So that's something that's been done in Windows Server. This is actually being lit up in Hyper-V in two separate ways. I'm going to be only showing you a video of one of them because, unfortunately, the other one's a bit more complicated to show. But I think the more complicated one is actually the cooler one, so I'll, I'll tell you about it. The first way that we're taking advantage of ODX support is in all of Hyper-V's storage operations. So uh, a storage migration using Hyper-V will take advantage of ODX. Uh, creation of VHDs, compaction of VHDs, any of these sorts of large I.O. operations, we now take advantage of ODX and offload it to the same. But something that's really cool, and I have to confess, when I first saw this, for me, this kind of borders on, like, black magic, is if you have a Windows Server box, it's connected to a SAN, the SAN's ODX capable, you put a VHD on that SAN, created a virtual machine with that VHD, you install Windows Server 2012, you're in the guest operating system, you copy a file, that file copy is offloaded to the SAN. Even though it's inside of the virtual machine and even though you've got multiple layers of abstraction between you, we've done the work to plumb that all the way up so that even inside of our virtual machine, running on an ODX-enabled SAN, you still get that performance benefit. So now I'm going to show you, unfortunately, a very blurry video. This is the demo that we did at Europe, and they did a bad job of capturing it. So hopefully, uh, you'll be able to follow along all the same. Um, this is actually a, a nice script that we have. So question, who here has ever created a 100 gigabyte plus fixed VHD. Takes a little bit, doesn't it? Hours. Um, I've personally, I, I recently had to rebuild a server and I had to create seven terabyte of fixed VHDs. And phew, that, was, that was actually the better part of 24 hours. So we have a very simple script here. And what we've done is we've set up a computer so that it has one volume that's ODX enabled and one volume that isn't. And we have this script that goes through and creates a 100 gig VHD on both volumes at the same time, if I can find my mouse. Apparently, oh, there we are. No, I genuinely cannot find it. Ah, there we go. Hey, thank you. OK. Now, the interesting thing to highlight, this is the same API. The only difference is different volumes. So we try and make sure it's in sync. 100 gig fixed VHD. Done. I love this. Let's see, 1%. 
So a little bit of difference here. You know, but what's happened in the ODX case is we've been able to go down to the SAN and say, hey, we need 100 gig of zeroed out data. The SAN knows everything about its own infrastructure, and it's going, oh, yeah, I have that. Here. Whereas in the non-ODX case, we've gone, we don't have any knowledge, so we're going to zero out that data. Um, and as you can see, there's a huge difference between the two approaches. So the final thing, and I will be really clear, uh, I have to put all the caveats on this. This is our own internal testing. Um, you should talk to a doctor before doing this yourself. Um, what's, what's the one that they say for stock? Uh, past performance is not an indicator of future, no, past data is not an indicator of future performance. So this is some test data, but I really, I'm really glad to be able to share this with you. This is some overhead testing that we've done. And I always get asked by people, hey, so what is the overhead of virtualization? Because, hey, virtualization does have an overhead. Anyone who tells you otherwise is lying. You know, it's our job to make it as small as possible, but it still does exist. So this is some testing that we did in our labs, you know, all caveats. But this can just give you an idea using uh, Hyper-V, on server 2012, uh, we did, and once again, legally, I'm not allowed to tell you the actual tests that we ran. I can tell you we ran some extensive SQL tests. Um, so very high load, very high throughput SQL. And we went through and we ran these on physical boxes. And what we actually did, we had some high-end uh, hardware in our lab. And when we did the test on the physical pro uh, boxes, we used BC Edit to limit the number of cores that it saw. So we did the test on the box with exactly the same amount of memory and cores uh, on the physical hardware and on the virtual machine. And this actually gives you uh, an indication. And we've captured a couple of things here. We've captured what the overall throughput was, what the overall CPU utilization was, and what the throughput loss was there. So as you can see, and the thing that I find fascinating is that we see far less throughput loss at 64 VP than we do at 32 VP. So what does that mean? Simple thing that that means is, and I say this with pride, if you know Microsoft well, you know that we're a company for lots of internal competition and jiving. What that means is the Hyper-V team does a better job of scaling than the SQL team does. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, with that in mind, we're uh, getting close to out of time. We've got some time for questions. I do want to thank you for your time. Um, here's some related content. I was uh, joking to a couple of people before. This is kind of like saying, come and see my other sessions. I actually have four sessions here. Uh, so, Stu was nice enough to take the networking one. He is on the next slot talking about networking, aren't you? Uh, last, slot. La last slot. That's right. We have a break. Then I'm going to be talking about storage. You're going to be talking about network. Tomorrow I'm going to be talking about replica and live migration, storage migration. And you can contact me uh, both on Twitter and on my blog. I have some feedback stuff. Um, now, before we open for question and answer, some nice people gave me this to give away. I was hoping someone would leave early so I could mock them. <laughs> but I have this to give away, and you've all been nice, and you haven't left. So I've, I've been racking my brain, um, and I've been trying to think of some tough questions for the audience to see who can get this. So we'll see. And it's, it's a level 400 session talking about virtualization, so I thought I need to come up with, let's see if, if the audience is up to it. So. I'm going to try, I, have one, I have two questions. We'll try one, and if someone answers it, then I won't try the second. So, virtualization. I've been doing virtualization for a long time now. I've been doing it for just over 10 years. I've worked with people who have been doing it for much longer. Now, who knows, and this isn't the question. I'll let you know when the real question is. Who knows the name of the company Microsoft acquired for virtualization? Connectix. Connectix. Not the real question. You don't win the laptop yet. Sorry. 
So it was Connectix, and I worked at Connectix, and I came across as part of the acquisition. We worked on two products, virtual PC, virtual server. Now, virtual PC was actually originally for, this isn't the question again. You can answer. It was for the Mac. So here's the question, and you might get the answer. We'll see. Here's the question that I have. Not the operating system. What was the chipset that the first version of virtual PC ran on? I hate to say it, the guy behind you got his hand up first. I'm looking for the specific model, but it actually well, Nope, that's the chipset inside it. I'm looking for the specific. No. It was the 68040. Can you, can you take this? Are you allowed to take this? Yeah, he's not allowed to take it. Ah, I thought that was the case. OK, let's try our second question. Microsoft, Microsoft people and government employees not allowed to answer. OK, OK, next question. Next question. No, I'm not going to let. Who can answer that question? No. Next question. So another historic architectural question. This is actually a tougher one, so we'll see, we'll see if we can get this. So when the Pentium 4 was first released, no, that was Pentium. When the Pentium 4 was first released, the world was very confused because Pentium 4s had these really high clock numbers. Like, you know, you get 2 gigahertz Pentium 4, but it performed slower than a 1 gigahertz Pentium 3. Does anyone know why? I see a hand up here. Um, no. <laughs> Bingo. You win a laptop. Do you want to come up and grab it? He'll come up afterwards. So yes, the Pentium 4 actually had a much longer pipeline. The Pentium 3 only would buffer up four, uh, four uh, commands, sometimes five. The Pentium 4 had a pipeline that was up to 20 instructions long. And unfortunately, it rarely filled the pipeline. So even though it had a really high clock speed, it often only ran at about half its capacity. So. With that in mind, we have a minute or two. We have three minutes. Any questions? How did you get the VHD performance to be better than pass-through? How did we get the VHD performance to be better than pass-through? Um, the, the short answer is we do sector alignment better inside of VHD than we do in a physical disk. And sector alignment is actually becoming a big performance issue today. Um, I'll, I'll actually talk specifically about sector alignment uh, in the next session. Um, we also do, um, with VHD, we're able to do a small amount of pre-allocation. We actually keep, uh, basically, one of the, the biggest overheads we have is clearing out an area before we write to it. With VHD, we actually keep uh, a block of space pre-written out, ready to go which we're not able to do with a, a pass-through device. What? <laughs> no, there aren't sleep commands in the pass-through code. You sound like one of our OEMs. Uh, <laughs> so the question was, why 320 processors? And the honest answer was, that's the biggest box we were able to test on. Um, from an architectural point of view, we don't know of any reason why we couldn't go above that. Um, but that's the biggest box we've been able to get uh, time testing. And it has a blurred out name in my videos. So the question is, with SROV, can you use the hardware features of the NIC? Yes, you can. Um, so any, uh, any capabilities uh, that a vendor puts on there, you can use uh, directly inside of the guest. Um, it looks like a real NIC.
It practically is. Um, so the question was, if you have more virtual machines configured um, for SIOV, then your system has capability. Is there any way of overriding it and, and making sure one system gets you know, SIOV? Um, today, no. It's something that we actually do want to do in the future. Uh, if, you ha if you had eagle eyes when you saw the PowerShell command, we actually call it setting the IOV weight. Um, and it's something that we want to do long term is to allow you to specify priority and say, like, this machine really needs IOV, these ones only if it's available. Uh, we haven't implemented that in server 2012. Uh, IOV weight in server 2012 can be zero or one. <laughs> <laughs> but that is something that we'd like to do in the future. So we're over time now. I'd like to say thank you all. Please do fill out your evaluation forms and uh, have a great show.